Well, thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, thank you for coming. Um, thanks to Mr. Sweeney and to uh, Beth Antoine for having me out here. Um, I'm talking about free speech on, on college campuses and uh, in particular about keeping an open mind and a humble heart once you get to college. Uh, as many of you have probably seen on the news, there are a lot of campus disruptions, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, sometimes chaos, a lot of protests, and I want to have you sort of uh, gain some context and a framework for, for analyzing those. But first, I want to talk to you about, about when I went to college, which really, to you, may seem like a long time ago, but to me, it feels as though it just happened. But uh, I remember I got to school, I got to college, and there was orientation, and uh, the first day, I got to my dorm room, and it was just this empty jail cell. cell. That's what it looked like. And uh, so I started setting up. I, my roommate hadn't, hadn't arrived yet. I'd never met the guy in my life. He was from Ohio. And uh, so I just picked you know, the top bunk, because I thought, well, I'll let this, this guy get the bottom bunk. And I just picked a desk on one side of the room. And Shortly, shortly thereafter, he shows up with an entourage. You know, he was there with all kinds of family, and and they came in, and we met. And after a while, we got everything set up, and then he and I decided we were just going to go explore, explore the building, and figure out what what was what and where everything was. So we walk down uh, these steps, and there's a big kind of common space, and behind that was the uh, the laundry room. So we walk in there, we walk into the laundry room. And uh, we're trying to figure out how to use these things called washers and dryers. And at the time, you actually had to put a quarter in the machine. I have no idea how they do these things now. But uh, you had to put a quarter in the machine to use it. And uh, as we're looking around the room, I see this thing on the wall. And it looks like a light switch. But instead of having the little flip switch, it has a button. And then above the button, there's just a little light that was green. And then below the light, there, were, there was some writing. And the writing said to test carbon monoxide levels, press button when the light is green. And I got to thinking, hmm, I wonder what the carbon monoxide levels are. I don't know like what levels would be good or bad, but I wonder what they are. So I reached up and I pressed the button. Instantly, you just heard eh, 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 the fire alarms for the whole building started going off. Now, my roommate that I just met looked at me like, what? are you crazy? What are you doing? Like, I can't believe you just set the fire alarm. I said, I just pressed this button. Then uh, we happened to be right outside the, the hallway where the football players lived. And they came out and they were mad. And they were like, I can't believe someone turned the fire alarm off. And we find out who did this. And the guy who I, you know, I just met him turns and looks at me and says, don't say a word. Don't say anything. And so rather than evacuating the building with everyone else, because we knew there was no fire, we knew there was no problem. We like slipped back the other way and went up into our rooms and, and just closed the door and said, we'll just wait it out. Well, before we had done that, we decided just to decorate our, our room. This was, this was earlier in the afternoon with just kind of a bunch of nonsense stuff. So we went to Walmart and we bought all kinds of signs. Like there was a stop sign and an exit sign and a men's bathroom sign and all kinds of little signs. And we plastered them all over the door. For some reason, that's how we decided to decorate the door. I don't know why. It's just one of those things. You do when you're 18 because you think it's funny. Well, as we're hunkered down in the uh, dorm room waiting for uh, the fire alarm to go off and, and, and waiting for the all clear sign and for people to come back into the building, all of a sudden we get a knock on the door. Bump, 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 bump. So I walk up to the door and I open it and there stands a fireman. And I'm thinking, oh no, now I'm gonna get in trouble. Like I'm busted. I, I'm going to get arrested because you're supposed to evacuate a building or they figured out that it was me who touched the button because of some sort of surveillance and now I'm going to get in trouble. And then the guy just points to the door and said, oh, I thought this was the bathroom. Sorry, because he saw the men's bathroom sign on the door and then he walked away and that was it. So I didn't get in trouble. Um, that was my first day on a college campus. Now, about a week later was my first day of class ever. And uh, Furman started late in the year. It's actually started in mid-September. I don't know if it still does, but we were on trimesters at the time, so it started late. And uh, my first day of class, I went, I remember it very well. I went into my philosophy class and uh, was pretty intimidated by uh, the level of discourse in the class. And it was primarily upperclassmen in that class. So 
Um, I felt maybe I was in over my head, but as I was leaving, I uh, was walking back from that class and some guy came up to me and said, hey, have you seen what happened this morning? I'm like, no, I was, I just was in class. What are you talking about? He said, you got to go to the TV right now. Some planes hit the, hit the, the world trade center. It's like, wait, wait, what's the, what's the world trade center? He's like, you know, those two big buildings in New York, the, they, the, these planes have hit the, hit the twin towers and like there was a restaurant up there and all kinds of crazy stuff is happening. I thought, what in the world are you talking about? So I went back to my dorm room and this guy was going to class. Classes hadn't been canceled or anything like that. It was just, you know, very much an ongoing situation. And uh, I turned on the TV and I was sitting there watching. And about five minutes after I was sitting there watching, I started seeing people hurling their bodies out of windows. And I saw bodies falling to the ground. I thought, wow, like what a tremendous weight to be my first day of college ever. You know, I was excited. I couldn't wait to get to my class. You know, I couldn't wait to study. And uh, this just brought a complete new view uh, to what I was doing in college. It sort of was one of these momentous uh, events where you suddenly put everything into context. And my dad had been traveling to, uh, to New York that day, and I couldn't get a hold of him on the phone, so I didn't know if he was okay. And uh, suddenly everything that I thought was important, fitting in at college, uh, having a good time at college, you know, study really minimized importance. I realized, you know, I'm here to learn, like I'm here to, to study and uh, not just to have a good time, not just to make friends, but really to live a good life. And that's the purpose of education really is to live a good life and to help other people with the knowledge that you acquire while you're studying. So it's difficult to impart that sense of gravity to people who don't have such a, you know, such an enormous uh, and disturbing situation on their first day of school, right? Um, but uh, I'll try to, to talk about sort of the purpose of, uh, or of, of higher education a little bit and what, why I believe freedom of speech is uh, important to the acquisition of knowledge. Um, I mentioned earlier that you see a lot of protests and things like that on college campuses, but you also see speech codes safe spaces, deplatforming, trigger warnings, disinvitations, uh, silencing speakers. And these to me are signs of, uh, of illiberal and intolerant policies. They, uh, they prioritize indoctrination, orthodoxy, conformity, narrow-mindedness, censorship, and dogmatism over the pursuit of knowledge and the uh, wide dissemination of ideas. Now, humor me for a minute. I want everyone to, to take your finger up and, and like pick a point on the ceiling and then draw a circle clockwise around that point. All right, look up at a point and, and hold, it, hold your hand up by your, up by your eyes yeah, and draw a circle clockwise. All right, now keep, keep your finger moving clockwise in that direction and bring it down to your chest. Keep doing it exactly the same down the chest. Now look at your finger. Which way is your finger moving? Did it change directions? No, it didn't change directions. Your finger is still moving in the same direction, but your perspective has changed, right? When you're up here, clockwise looks one way, and then it comes down here, oh, changes direction. Like, try this. All right, we're going clockwise. You see clockwise, but what would somebody on that side see? They would see the opposite. So my point is, is that sometimes you need to keep in mind that your perspective influences what you see. That sometimes what you take to be absolutely 100% true may not look the same way to somebody else. You know, that, that was, it was true that you were, moving, you were moving that circle clockwise, but it was also true that you were moving that circle counterclockwise. You had tr two truths simultaneously in existence that all depended on perspective. Now, uh, there was a, uh, a British philosopher, political economist, uh, classical liberal, utilitarian, member of parliament uh, named John Stuart Mill. Um, he was an abolitionist on the slavery issue. He advocated women's suffrage. Um, and he uh, was a 19th century guy. 
And he was a, an advocate of the free and open exchange of ideas. And he had three main reasons for this. Um, reasons that you don't want to su suppress speech with, with, with which you disagree. Reasons you ought to try to hear competing viewpoints. Reasons why you ought to invite debate rather than shutting it down. Uh, the first one is that however controversial ideas may seem, they might actually be right. So just because something is controversial doesn't mean that it's automatically wrong. Um, the sort of classic example of this is if you look back at, at Galileo and he advocated heliocentrism, which is the idea that the planets uh, revolved around the sun rather than you know, the sun revolving around the earth. And this was considered heresy that, wow, you know, the earth is the center of the universe. It, it, so that's the classic example. I'll, I'll start with just sort of a more mundane example, which is when I was a kid, my grandmother had a dog. It was a, it was a little shit zoo. Scared some of you for a second, didn't you? It was a little, it was a little shit zoo and it fit in a bucket. And all my friends and I, I think we must have been six or seven years old, we were, we were playing in uh, the playground and my next door neighbor and his little brother decided to put this poor dog in the bucket and send him down the slide. And they were doing this over and over again. And my mom saw us from the kitchen window and she came running out and she said, you know, stop doing that right now. And I, everyone, everyone was getting in trouble. My friends got sent home and she said, Alan, I can't believe you would send that, that dog down the slide like that. And my defense was, well, oh, your, your eyes made you see something that didn't happen. That's what I said. Your eyes made you see something that didn't happen. She thought that was actually a funny response. But my point was, I, I didn't send the dog down the slide. It wasn't my idea. I didn't do it. You know, that was their idea. It was my friend's idea. Jared and Brad in particular, if you ever run into them, you'll have to hold them accountable. But it was their idea. They were the ones that sent, sent the dog down the slide. It wasn't me. And uh, this was an, a situation that I, I took to be like, well, if she had if she had gained my perspective on the situation, I wouldn't be getting in trouble. I was not the guilty one. Of course, her argument was that you ought to have stepped in and stopped it. It was your responsibility. It was your grandmother's dog. You should have stopped your friends from doing something bad to it. But uh, because we didn't explain our positions to each other, we didn't actually gain an understanding of, of each other's perspective. So number one, Mill. However controversial ideas may be, they're not wrong just because they're controversial. They may be right. Number two, uh, even if we are right about what we believe, so even if you do hold a position that turns out to be true, you refine your understanding of it, you have a better sense of it if you subject it to the scrutiny of others. So you actually improve your ideas by pitting them against opposition, right? I mean, how often have you been uh, challenged to defend something that you hold dear. I mean, whether it be a religious belief or a political belief or whatever it is, but the act of having yourself challenged means what? You have to go research. You have to go figure out the reasons why you believe it is what you believe. I mean, in my view, the right way to acquire a belief is to do it through uh, you know, evidence gathering in the process, right? You don't just believe something and then try to prove it later. You believe something because it's been proven to you and you've actually undergone the process of inquiry to, to ascertain that belief. But, uh, but by arguing with somebody you disagree with, and I say arguing in the sense of a, a civil argument. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a lawyer, so arguing is not actually a bad word in the law. Arguing just means you're having a conversation about something you, uh, on which you disagree. But, uh, I have a friendship with a guy named Ashby Pate, and he and I have very different political views. And he's in Birmingham, and, uh, and he and I talk all the time about politics, and we couldn't disagree more. But we are able to do so civilly. We are able to do so as friends. We're able to do so in good faith. We're not out to try to convert the other person to our views, but just to, just to have a conversation. Just It's always constantly, like, I want him to see where I'm coming from. And I want him to see why it is I believe what I believe. And he wants the same thing, vice versa. And I believe I have a much deeper understanding of his positions because of this process and that he has a much deeper understanding of my positions. Um, the last reason that John Stuart Mill advocates for free expression, open inquiry, and not suppressing the speech of others is that we may find that what we think to be totally opposing views 
contain some nuggets of truth in them, that they may not be completely wrong, but they may be partially wrong, but there may be parts of it that are actually right. And you wouldn't know that if you didn't fully engage with the other idea. So you've heard the expression, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. That's why I'm not a fan of, of history where that, that goes something like this, like, oh, this person's, this person's really bad, so we throw that person's thought out and everything that person did is bad. And then this person's really good, so we do everything this person said. You know, I tend to find that human beings are much more complex than just sort of these one-dimensional caricatures that we see often in the media or in sort of amateur histories, but uh, that there are complicated dynamics at play. People change their views, they change their minds, they take different positions, and that if you really take the time to explore, you'll find, oh, there may be some things that I actually, dis uh, that, excuse me, that I actually agree with. Um, so my message to you, I guess in short, is be humble and open-minded, be tolerant and receptive, um, there's a poem by Robert Frost. Does everyone know who Robert Frost was? He was a New England poet. You probably read him in uh, your English classes, but I want to set the scene for you in this, this poem. So imagine rural New England out there. It's in some kind of woods and it's cold. There's snow on the ground. The snow is actually falling and it's very dark. And there's a man and his horse and they're all alone out there. And so the poem begins like this. This is the speaker. This is the old man speaking. He says, whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near, between the woods and frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. The only other sounds the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. So as you sit here today in high school, my goodness, what I wouldn't do to be back in high school again, how awesome it would be to be 17 or 18 years old right at the prime of life where you've got everything to look forward to You've got miles to go before you sleep. And you look at the chaos on TV, you look at the news and everything looks bad, it looks crazy, it looks disorienting. And it is easy to be drawn to the darkness, to just say, ah, there's so much suffering. I just wanna stay out here in the woods by myself. You know, I just wanna be isolated. I don't wanna, I don't want to, I don't wanna go on anymore. It's hard trudging through this snow in the darkness but you've got miles to go before you sleep. You've got an entire lifetime ahead of you. Think about how much of an impact you're gonna make on people's lives. And uh, there really has never in human history been a better time to be alive. Think about what you've got right here in your hand. In this iPhone, you contain more data, more information than any physical library that's ever existed in human history. You've got all kinds of opportunity. You've got unparalleled access to medicine, high quality of life, uh, institutions that would not have even been dreamed of a little over a century ago. You can hop on a plane and be anywhere in the country before the day's out. I mean, this is amazing. We are living in an amazing time. At any instant, you can have a conversation in real time with anybody on this planet. That is absolutely amazing astounding. We should be amazed. We take it for granted because, you know, we've just, we've grown up with it and we've we're gotten used to technology, but it is amazing the world we live in. And I would submit to you that if you come to college with an open mind and you are tolerant of other views and you want to come with a commitment to listen to other people you disagree with, you'll be able to make this world an even better place, that those are the types of things that enable human progress and advancement, that shouting people down, not letting them speak, deprives them of the opportunity to give you a point of view, a perspective that you may not have had before, and you may come later to appreciate that point of view. You may change your mind. You may learn more. And so I would encourage you, when you do go to college, to be open-minded and to listen to other views and to really challenge yourself to be a better person through that process.
thank you very much for having me, and uh, I'm happy to take questions if we have time.